Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on sound waves. The topic of this video is sound interference in beats. And we want to know how do two sound waves interfere and what is the result and what role does sound interference play in the world of music. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In a previous video, this one, I discussed the interference of waves and I've left a link to the video in the description section of this one if you need to review it. In the video, I mentioned that wave interference occurs whenever two waves moving through the same medium in different directions meet up with one another. There's two forms of interference. First, there's constructive interference in which both interfering waves attempt to displace the particles of the medium in the same direction. And then there's destructive interference in which wave one attempts to displace the particles of the medium in an opposite direction as wave two. In both cases, each wave has its own individual influence upon the medium. But when they meet, the medium momentarily takes on a shape and size that reflects the influence of each wave. For instance, in the diagram on the left, since both waves are attempting to displace place the particles upwards, when they're perfectly overlapped, the medium is displaced upwards a super large amount. In the case of the diagram on the right, since both waves are attempting to displace the medium in opposite directions, their individual influence is canceled by the other wave. The result is the particles of the medium are not displaced at all when both of these waves are perfectly overlapped. In this tutorial series on sound waves, we said that sound waves moving through fluids such as air do not have crests or troughs. Instead, they're longitudinal waves in which the particles vibrate back and forth, parallel and anti-parallel to the direction that the wave travels, and the result is that you have compressions and rarefactions. So if you're thinking right now, you might say, but wait, how can interference of sound waves take place if there's no crests or troughs? And the answer can be understood if we look a little bit deeper at the concept of compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are those regions of space within a sound wave where the particles are being pulled together. They're high density regions or high pressure regions. And rarefactions are just the opposite. They're those regions of the medium where the particles are being spread apart. They're low pressure and low density regions of air. So if you have a compression meeting up with a compression, both of those regions are having the same identical direction of influence upon the medium, and as such, they would constructively interfere. The same can be said about a rarefaction and a rarefaction. The influence of each rarefaction is in the same direction, and thus constructive interference takes place. On the other hand, destructive interference would take place whenever you have a compression meeting up with a rarefaction, because after all, the influence of a compression is the opposite as the influence of a rarefaction, and they would destroy each other's influence or cancel each other's influence out, resulting in destructive interference. In this short repeating movie, we'll observe that there's a coiled spring attached to a lab pole at the top and to a speaker at the bottom. The speaker is attached to a sine wave generator that causes that speaker to vibrate up and down. And as it does, it will send longitudinal waves upwards through that coiled spring. Those waves will strike the lab pole and reflect back downwards through the coiled spring. Thus, we have two waves moving through the coiled springs that will interfere, one coming from the speaker itself and one reflecting off of the lab pole. And at just the right frequency will form a longitudinal standing wave pattern. A standing wave pattern is characterized by points that appear to be standing still. These points that appear to be standing still are referred to as nodes and are indicated by the red arrows in this still diagram. They're called nodes because they're points of no displacement or no disturbance. The coils aren't being disturbed at all at those locations because at those locations, destructive interference is always taking place. The influence of a compression of one of these longitudinal waves is canceling or destroying the influence of the rarefaction of the other longitudinal wave. Thus, you have no motion. 
Now at other locations spaced in between these nodes are antinodes. These are points that are vibrating wildly, formed by constructive interference of a compression of both waves meeting up, or a rarefaction of both waves meeting up. Because these points are vibrating wildly, as you see by the blue arrows on the still diagram, the coils are actually blurred since they're moving constantly back and forth. Now for a longitudinal standing wave, like any standing wave, the location of the nodes and the antinodes are permanently fixed. Our coiled spring demonstration demonstrates what occurs when longitudinal waves meet while traveling along a one-dimensional medium, like the coiled spring. But what happens when waves meet while traveling through a two-dimensional or three-dimensional medium? I have a physics experiment to describe to help us understand. Let's suppose that we have two speakers in a very large room that are placed relatively close together and are playing the same frequency. And let's suppose that we have students walk across the room along a line that is parallel to the line connecting the two speakers. What would the students hear as they walked along this line? To understand the answer, let's look at this diagram a little more closely. You'll notice in this diagram that the compressions that are concentric about either one of the speakers are represented by bold lines and the rarefactions are represented by thin lines. So we have a pattern of alternating compressions and rarefactions spreading through the space surrounding each of the speakers. And because we have two longitudinal waves, two sound waves meeting up while traveling in different directions along the same medium, we will have interference occur and some of the interference will be constructive and other destructive. Now if we look at these blue dashed lines on the diagram, you'll notice they have one thing in common. They are locations where you always have a compression meeting a compression, or a rarefaction from one speaker meeting a rarefaction from the other speaker. Constructive interference occurs at these locations. They're antinodes and they are aligned along relatively straight lines. Now if you compare that to these green dash lines, you'll notice what they have in common is a compression from one speaker is meeting up with a rarefaction from another speaker. Destructive interference is occurring to cause at these locations relatively no disturbance of the air. It's in this normal state of not being disturbed. And these are called nodal lines or nodes aligned along relatively straight lines. Now we're prepared to answer the question of what would students hear if they walked along a straight line parallel to the line connecting the speakers as shown here in the diagram. The students would reach a nodal line and they would hear a relatively silent or quiet sound. Then they would come to an antinodal line at which point they would hear a loud sound from constructive interference followed in alternating fashion by a silent or quiet sound, by a loud sound, by a quiet slash silent sound, followed by a loud sound. They would reach alternating nodal and antinodal lines and would hear the sound fading out and then fading in very loudly. Sound interference plays a critical role in the world of music. Music does not consist of one sound wave with a single frequency played continuously. A musical enthusiast would not pay big money to go hear the orchestra play 262 hertz for two hours. For most instruments, when a desired frequency is produced, it is combined with overtones. Less intense, higher frequency sounds, which combine with the desired frequency sound wave to produce a pleasant result. In fact, the quality of music is always enhanced when there are two or more sound waves that combine or interfere to produce a pleasant result. A Greek mathematician and philosopher who you likely have heard of by the name of Pythagoras said that music is not only pleasing to the ear, but also pleasing to the mathematical mind. Now when a mathematician says something is pleasing, I bet they're thinking in terms of ratios and patterns. To demonstrate, let me show you the waveforms for two sound waves that sound rather good together. We refer to this as an octave, 
any two sound waves with a 2 to 1 frequency ratio. Here in this 8 one hundredth second of a waveform, we see 262 hertz shown in blue, and in green we show 524 hertz having twice the frequency. When these two sound waves are played together, they will interfere to produce the red waveform. And it's this red waveform that an ear would pick up on. Now if you inspect the red waveform, you're going to notice that there's a portion of it that is repeating itself three times over the course of eight one hundredths of a second. These dashed boxes show that portion of the waveform that's repeating. Here it is, and you'll notice three times we see this in the course of less than eight one hundredths of a second. Now this is known as an octave, two sound waves with a two to one frequency ratio. The fact is that there are several combinations of frequencies that sound good together, and they all have simple frequency ratios like two to one, three to two, four to three, five to four, etc. Here's a second combination known as a fifth. Any two sound waves with frequencies that have a 3 to 2 ratio are categorized as being separated by a fifth. We say 524 hertz in blue and 786 hertz in green, and in red we see the result of the interference of these two sound waves. And once more, if you inspect the red wave, you'll see three repetitions of a pattern that have occurred within eight one hundredths of a second, and if we had a longer, wider plot, we'd see it repeating over and over and over again. These dash boxes show you that portion of the sound wave that is repeating. It includes a tall peak, a small peak, and a medium-sized peak repeating two more times within less than eight one hundredths of a second. Now let's contrast these simple frequency ratios to two sounds that don't have so much of a simple frequency ratio, like these two frequencies. These two frequencies, when played together, would not sound very pleasant to the air. 425 hertz in blue, 786 hertz in green, and there is no simple frequency ratio between these two frequencies. Of course, there's always going to be a frequency ratio like 786 to 425, but it's not a simple ratio like 2 to 1, 3 to 2, 4 to 3, 5 to 4, etc. Now, if you inspect the red wave pattern, which is the result of the interference, what you don't see is you don't see anything that's exactly repeating itself over and over again within the eight one hundredths of a second that are shown. Now maybe if we got about eight seconds of a waveform, we'd finally find a repetition, but the ear would not pick up on that repetition as being pleasant. So these two sound waves, when played together, are not pleasant sounding sounds. Musical beats is another important application of sound interference to the world of music. The orchestra tunes their instruments to one another by listening for musical beats as two instruments are played together. To demonstrate musical beats, let's consider this animation of a 110 Hz tuning fork and a 105 Hz tuning fork producing sound waves. The plot that you see in this animation is a plot of the pressure as a function of time for these two specific waves. As we scroll through the time bar and begin to expand it, you notice that the red wave and the blue wave have a pressure peak that is slightly offset from one another. But if we continue to expand the, the time, what we notice is soon there's a location where the pressure maximum for the red wave matches up perfectly with the pressure minimum for the blue wave, destructive interference takes place, and we would have zero pressure at that point. Now if we continue to expand this particular plot, what we would eventually see is the emergence of the so-called beat pattern. The beat pattern that you see right here is signature of beats being played. You would observe beats whenever two sounds of similar frequencies are played together. And what an observer observes when they hear beats is they observe repeated and regular fluctuations in the intensity of a sound wave over the course of time. If you inspect the diagram, you'll notice there's points where constructive 
interference occurs, and those are signified by the maximum and the minimum values indicated in red, and there's other points where destructive interference occurs, and we have a zero relative pressure. Now, every beat pattern is characterized by a so-called beat frequency. The beat frequency indicates the frequencies at which the intensity fluctuates from zero to a maximum back down to zero again. If we inspect this particular diagram, what we'll notice is that there are zero intensities at 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.9 seconds. These zeros occur every 0.2 seconds apart in time. 0.2 seconds is known as the beat period. Since frequency is the reciprocal of the period, we can say that the beat frequency is 1 divided by 0.2 seconds, and that comes out to be 5 hertz. 5 hertz is the beat frequency here, which means that 5 times per second an observer would hear the the intensity fluctuate from zero to a maximum back down to zero. The beat frequency is always the difference in frequencies for, of the two sounds that produce the beats. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are four resources that you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each in the description section of this video. The top two are simulations that I use to prepare this video, and you can use them as well to expand your understanding of the concepts. There's a concept builder here that's perfect for giving you practice and finally a tutorial page for brushing up on the topic. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H and I thank you for watching.